All right, brothers and sisters. What's the nice way of saying shut your mouth and open your open your brains? Um, here is here is an award-winning lecture on some major parts of the brain. Specifically, we're going to be looking at pathways, four or five different pathways that exist within the brain. Looking at the structures, what? Pathway. Reward pathway is going to be one of them. Excellent work, Alex Stoyan. That was Alex Stoyan for those of you keeping score at home. Um, reward pathway is definitely going to be one of them. We're going to look at the, the anatomy of the brain, and we're going to look at the major players in these different pathways. Stop me if I go too fast and ask questions, and I will do my best to be as um, helpful as possible. So the overview of the brain itself, we've got all the, the major parts of the brain. So let's take a look at some of the major parts. If we're looking at, oh, I don't know, this big, wrinkly, walnut looking thing that's got the consistency of a mushroom, what do you call that bit? Yes, Ashley Crane. This bit right here. That bit right there. What do you got? That is the cerebrum. Were you going to say that, Terry? The cerebrum. And an acceptable answer would have also been, why, that's me. That's me. Because it is. This is really you. The other parts of the brain. This, parts of, this part of the brain is like the body functioning stuff. But it isn't really you. You don't do your the cool human stuff from those parts of the brain. This bit is the bit that, be, that is you. So, all right, let's see if I can um, advance... Slide. I've written all over this. I should probably not. Yeah. Whoops. Oh, course plus I remember that. Yeah. Well, I've written all over my slide. Oh well. Oh well, I'm not worried. Um. So the corpus callosum. What does the corpus callosum do? Oh, I don't know. Let's call on somebody completely at random. Completely at random. Jason. What does the corpus Colosum do. I'm sorry. Not quite. Sophia, do you know? Corpus callosum? It connects both hemispheres. You got your right and your left hemisphere. They communicate through the corpus callosum. It's a very thin layer of axons that connects the right and the left hemisphere. They communicate so that your right brain and your left brain can communicate. The left brain, which is the I am, he ha, I am here, here is me, this is, this is me, this is you. And the right brain, which is more like, what did the lady say yesterday? The la la land. I want to have that experience. Does anybody else want to have the experience that that lady had? That was amazing. That was amazing. All right. Thalamus. What? Drugs. drugs definitely it sounds very much like a similar like drug drug experience that some people have had ecstasy might be something that be related to that thalamus itself does anybody know what the thalamus does ideas thoughts oh I don't know Cameron Barney thoughts on the thalamus opinions words of wisdom oh I don't know nuggets of knowledge he knew it at some point in your life He's drawing a blank. Can anybody help him fill in the gap on what the thalamus does? Maybe purview your past notes on the thalamus. He asks with patience. Bated oh. breath. Thalamus. It's near the tippity top of that brain stem. If that helps at all. Sleep? No. They're not writing down. Hypothalamus, which is just below the thalamus, which I think is the very next one I think I put on there. The hypothalamus. Oh, it's the switchboard. Yeah, the thalamus is like the um, thalamus is like the hey, this uh, this should go here, this should go here, which is important. Signals need to go to the correct location. If they don't go to the correct location, then they can get mixed up. Hypothalamus. What does the hypothalamus do? Oh, sorry. What does the hypothalamus do? Any thoughts on the hypothalamus? So thalamus is like the, the switchboard change things. Any thoughts on the hypothalamus? He asked. Richard Bertrand, I know you have an opinion on the hypothalamus. Tell me what your opinion is. 
The hypothalamus is awesome, Mr. Brewer. The hypothalamus sucks. I had it out for over for drinks and it didn't clean up after itself. Yes. Does it like organize everything we're supposed to go? Does the hypothalamus do the organizing? Not quite. Yes. It has to do with cycles, sleeping and so the, sleeping and cycles. The and, yeah, what has do you call to do with it? cycles. What's the sleep cycle called? The uh, circadian rhythm. Circadian. circadian rhythm. And then we've got the brain stem itself. Brain stem's function is what? Oh, Vanessa. Brain stem function. What do you got, Vanessa? Brain stem. What does the brain stem do? Of course, all of these have other functions. So if you look it up in the book and go, wait, Mr. Brewer, that's not true. It also does it also does those other things. So we speak in generalities and specifics. Brainstem, functioning. I'm gonna ask. Do you need some help? We're translating it as we speak. Sneeze? Yes? Breathe? Blink? Blink, breathe. Heartbeat? Yeah. Puke, definitely. What do we call those things, Josh Decker? Those functions that where it's like breathing, blinking, sneezing. Autonomic. Autonomic. So so we've got we've got here, we've got cerebrum. Let's change color. Will this, will this stuff be on Inmodo? Yeah, this, this, this PowerPoint will be on Inmodo. Cerebrum, which is the higher order thinking. Thalamus, which is switchboard. It's the switchboard says this signal goes here. It's at the tippity top of the brain of the uh, brain stem. It's the thing that says, hey, do this, do this, and it, it, it's part of that system. Hypothalamus, which is regulation of the... The regulation of your uh, homeostatic things. Drives, hunger, sleep, wake... And the brain stem, which is autonomic. What? Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus does that, yes. The thalamus is the wow. switchboard. So, like, All right. if, I, if I, like, if I'm having breakfast every day, that's the hypothalamus, the signals I'm hungry, and that one? Yeah. All right. Yes. And the cerebellum. What does the cerebellum do? Terry. Attention all students. There is an ASB middle school meeting in Ms. Schmidt's classroom. Middle school ASB meeting in Ms. Schmidt's Awesome. Terry, what do you think the cerebellum does? Think of a bell, if that helps. What? Excellent guess. You weren't here for this lecture, so you don't know, so we're going to fill in the gaps. And the cap below, help him out. You have a particularly well-developed cerebellum. What does that mean? M muscle coordination. You're a good dancer. I've seen you. He dances like an angel. So cerebellum is muscle coordination. The mu cerebellum, what it does... It's uh, something called the motor cortex. The motor cortex says, hey, we need to move. Sends it down to the thalamus, which sends it out to the cerebellum, which sends it down to the, to the uh, spine. But at this point down here in the cerebellum, it says, all right, we need to make sure that the right muscles are moving in the right amount, in the right proportion, in the right direction. Well, and so it says, this muscle, this muscle, this muscle moves, this muscle, this muscle, this muscle relax. That's what the cerebellum does. It coordinates the signal. Yes. Does it uh, signal from the spinal cord have to come first in the cerebellum through the brain and back? Yeah, the it can, works the other way. These are these signals are all bidirectional. So you can also have a signal coming up and then from the, through the cerebellum to the sensory cortex to say, here's how much this muscle moves. You get the feedback. Without that feedback and how much it moves, you won't know if you actually completed the movement, like scratching your your eye. If you don't get the feedback for how far you've actually moved, you could like knock yourself in the face, which sometimes happens. Sometimes you go to scratch your eye. Don't judge. Sometimes you go to scratch your eye and, uh, you know, you get hit in the face. The world is a vampire. All right. I click it twice, which means it's going to go twice. All right. Organization of the cerebrum. We already have these notes, so I'm going to go through this fast. Outside is gray matter. Inside is white matter. Um, we know that um, it's like the the core or the rind of an, an orange. The rind of an orange. You have the outside, the inside. Gray matter is the body, 
The white matter is the axons of a nerve. Wait, the white matter is the axon? The white matter is the axon. Remember, the axons of a nerve are wrapped in these fatty sheets called myelin sheets. The axons of a nerve are wrapped in that fat, and that's what makes the white matter white. So what's the gray matter? Made? That's the body of the nerves. That's the nuclei of the, the nucleus of the cells. So, oh, the bodies so of the cells. white matter is the axon, and the gray matter is everything else? The white matter is the axons, and the gray matter is the body of the cells. You can kind of say that the gray matter is the... Oh, boy, if, if Nurse Linda, or Doc Linda hears this, she's going to kill me. Um, the gray matter is the thinking and the white matter is the connecting bit. So don't listen to this lecture. But it's, it's not bad. So you got the outside is the cortex. It's the cerebral cortex. And that's this bit. That's this bit right here is the cerebral cortex. Yeah? All right, the cerebrum itself, the organizational parts of the cerebrum. Again, I will share this PowerPoint online. Um, you'll have this, but I just go for the major parts of this so that you have um, the major bits when we talk about this. Cortex means the outer bit. That's what the word cortex means. So if we say... Put this over here out of my way. So if we say the prefrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, that's going to be the front of the brain. This is front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. Prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is responsible for? Prefrontal, prefrontal cortex is front, responsible for? Personality. personality, drive, emotion. It's the bit that it's the bit of your cortex that becomes you. So your prefrontal cortex is you. So if I hit you in the forehead hard enough, it's a good chance I can change your personality, which is why I headbutt my students so much. All right. Motor association cortex. It's right here. That's the motor association cortex. That's the bit of the brain as part of voluntary motor movement. It's an association cortex, which is... Um, it helps us voluntarily move our muscles. The primary motor cortex... This bit right here is the bit that we use to actually make the command. But it takes a lot of our brain to, because it's a complicated thing to move a muscle. It's really complicated because the signals from the nerves are all or nothing, which means when you decide to fire a nerve, it goes 100% or it goes not at all. You can't fire a nerve halfway. An action potential can only go all the way. It's an all or nothing firing, which means if you're sending, and the same thing works with a muscle, but our muscles don't move all or nothing. I can move my arm halfway, not all the way. Muscle movement's insane. But every one of those cells that chooses to fire moves all the way. So when I move my arm, when I move it halfway, that means I'm coordinating which fibers um, pull and which fibers relax. And it's an incredibly complex task, which means that this bit and this bit, the motor association cortex and the primary motor cortex, are working in concert to, to uh, coordinate that. Then they go through the cerebellum, which finishes the, the puzzle and sends it to the right nerves. Yes, Alec? So the primary motor cortex sends the signal to the motor association cortex, which then moves the muscle. Yeah, the primary motor cortex is where you get the, I want to do this thing. I want to blink my eye because that girl is pretty. I'm going to wink at her, right? So that, that muscle needs to move. So you have the desire to do that. Actually, that comes out of your, that comes out of your prefrontal cortex. I want to do this moves to the primary motor cortex and says, all right, to do this defined motion, which is wink, you must have these specific nerves fire. Sends it to the motor association cortex, which then sends it on down to the cerebellum, which gets the job done. It actually does the, the movement. Cerebellum doesn't do any of the thinking. It just does the mechanical sending it to the right spot. Right next to the motor cortex is something we call the somatosensory cortex. Somatosensory. What does that mean? Somatosensory. It is not. Does anybody know what somatosensory is? Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Richard, Richard, how you doing over there? You look good. Your hair makes you look a little bit like the Wolverine. You got this little thing going on. <laughs> Looks good. Yes, Ashley. Body senses. It's your sense of position and feeling. So if somebody touches your tummy... With the, somebody touches your tummy with a feather, you know it's touching that region of your body because 
on the primary somatostatic cortex, it's somewhere right about here, is the tummy bit. So the nerve that's attached to that, the sensory nerve that's attached to that, goes up the spinal cord, goes through the pons, goes through the thalamus, and ends up there. And if that part of your brain fires, you go, oh, my tummy was touched. Or, oh, my nose was touched. <coughs> You're upside down on here. This is your head, this is your head, and this is your feet. So what is it called if it takes forever for you to feel that? Like it takes forever, you have uh, maybe nerve damage, or you have something going on. It should take less than a second for you to feel that. So One thirtieth of a second. Those nerves fire at about 30 times a second. Which is why we can be fooled by a bunch of still pictures in a row. Looks like movement to us because it goes faster than that. So your brain fills in the gaps. Because in real life, if you see this, you don't actually see me moving. You see me, and then me again, and then me again, and me again, and me again. Your brain fills in the gaps between them. And if you're on TV, you see the same thing. You see a picture, and then another picture, and then another picture. But it comes so fast, your brain fills in the gap between them. And you see what looks like movement. It's like, you know, like the two colors, and then they combine to make a different color. That's a that's an artifact of the rods and cones in your eyes. So it's not the same when your brain is still in because you can't make out. Maybe. Depends. Okay. So you got the primary and then the sensory association cortex. All this bit right here is sensing. So you got prefrontal cortex, which is your personality, you got motor cortex, and then you got sensory cortex. I'm probably not gonna have you differentiate between the primary and the uh, association centers, but you got Prefrontal cortex, motor, and then you got somatic, you got the sensory cortex. Those are the parts of the brain. So you got the feeling and the movement and the personality. As we work, work our way back to the back of the brain, the visual association and the visual cortex. This much of your brain is vision. We are very much directed by vision. We are visual animals. So we are visual animals. Vision, visual association and visual cortex, those are vision. What about the sensory association cortex? This bomb. sensory is for body sensations. So it goes along with that one? Yeah, it goes with the primary system. So sensory association and primary, it's just like the muscle, just like the motor had an association at primary. Oh, it goes exactly same way. Same way. Same arrangement. And it's the same order, actually, which is interesting. Actually, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you this. Let me pause real quick. Oh, All right, so so to uh, talk about the, the motor and the sensory cortex real quick, the arrangement is the same for person to person or mostly the same. So if we took this, the brain and we did a cut, we did a sectional cut like this, and we cut down that, uh, the, the, one in the, the one in the back is the motor, the one in the front is the sensory, you'll see this is the motor cortex uh, right here. It's the motor cortex right here. <coughs> So this is motor, and this is sensory. Oh yeah. So we got the motor, and we got the sensory cortex. Uh, you'll notice at the top of the brain, at the top of the brain, you've got your toes, you got your knees, you got your hiney, you got your shoulders, you got your hands, and then you got your head. The head's upside down in relation to the rest of the body. So you got your it goes toes to the hands. And then you got your eyes. Notice how big the lips are. What? The lips are huge. The lips are huge. Why do you think the lips are so big? Um, Claire, why do you think the lips are so big? Shh. Why are the lips so big? What the heck? She's blowing her mind. That part of the brain, so if, if that part of the brain, the, the nerves in that part of the brain fire, that means you're feeling something with your lips. Why are the lips so huge in comparison to like the tiny little toes? Why are there people in the brain? Babies know this. You give a baby a toy, what's the baby do? Puts it in its mouth. Because it has more nerves in its mouth than it has in its fingers. It has more nerves, so it's going to experience more. And you guys know this. Your, your lips are very sensitive, which is why we use them to express affection with people. Because we feel better with them. Touching fingers is nice. Touching lips is much better. So the reason our lips are so big on this diagram is because we have more nerves there. We're more sensitive. So people with smaller lips have less nerve volume, but they probably have the same amount of 
brain space that was required to it. The size of the lips, I don't think, matters. It's not the size that matters. You know this. It's how you use it. Yes? Uh, you said that's the arrangement most people have. What would change if, like, the toe was, like, near the eye in a sensory, like, area? I honestly don't know if that anything would change. I think the brain would be adjusted. Or... You're, you get all confuzzled, and you would you would you sometimes get this. Have you ever had a weird itch that you can't scratch because you don't know where it's at? Yeah. yeah. You're like, ah, where is it? And it's actually somewhere else. Or there's something called <laughs> deferred pain, where you feel pain, but you don't know where it's coming from, and it feels like it's coming from one part of the body, and it's actually not there. Um, I'm already starting to get itches and scratches and stuff. Um, it happens. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, um, you get those you get those kind of weird things, and that can be uh, the the signal got sent to the wrong part of the body. Same idea with the motor cortex. You'll notice the tongue's down here. This is the tongue. You got the chin. The head's a large part of the motor cortex, and then you got your hands. Look at those hands. Look how much of the brain is response is is uh, yeah, yeah. the reason why it's a complicated brain? Yeah, there's a really good theory that the brains, our brains evolved to be so big. Our brains are ridiculous. It takes over a third of our energy to run our brains. It's an incredibly expensive organ. Doesn't make a lot of evolutionary sense, except for these things right here. These things right here probably drive the evolution of our brain because this complex motor, this really complex motor movement required a tremendous part of our brain. The motor. Part of our hands is gigantic. Again, sensory too. We use these, started using these hands much more complex, and so our brains had to grow in response to that, and that's why we have a big brain. It just drag everything else with it. Yeah, well, you just notice, use your hands more than your feet. Hands, the hand cortex, toe cortex. It's a lot less. What's the point of having toes? We we'll use them. We we'll use them. No, Terry asked an excellent question. What's the point of having toes? There's, um... Okay, so when we develop as embryos... And boy, don't listen to this, Doc Linda. Um, when we develop as embryos, uh, your body build, has a basic body plan. It says, you're going to use these genes called Hox genes to do this. It says, build this, build this, and then build this, and build this, and build this in this order. And it, has a, it follows a general plan. And so it has this plan for limb. It has this basic plan for limb. And it says, okay, you're going to build it in this order. So you're going to have... One bone, two bones, lots of bones, and then you're going to have this ar this array of bones, and that's your fingers. Follows the same plan with your leg legs. Same set of sheets. Follows them slightly differently based on the chemical concentrations, but it follows the same order. It's easier to just repeat the plan than it is to make a whole new plan to make the limb. Does that make sense? So instead of arm and making legs separately, it makes them. It follows the same basic plan for both of them. It just modifies them. Well, that's why we have toes because it, that's why males have nipples because we're following the same basic plan. We don't make. We don't invent a new plan. So, but is it our toes still have? Like, what a fun word that is, isn't it? Nipples. Don't yeah. they still have like an evolutionary advantage, like for running and walking? Don't they actually help? Yeah, and if you don't think toes, and Terry, if you don't think your toes are important, go go for a little while without them, and you'll find out. Holy cow, they do a lot of actually sensing my balance and my posture and stuff. Well, I was going to ask if that's really Just cut them off. If I so they will grow back. If your brain was never able to look at itself, if your brain was never able to look at itself and could only get information based on its sensory cortex, if your brain could only get information based on sensory cortex, your brain would have an image of yourself that looks like that. That would be you. Called the that's called that's called the homunculus. So that if your that, if your brain could see itself. Homunculus. That's called the homunculus. Now in our brain it's upside down. This is like the top of the brain. This is like the bottom of the brain. And the head. Remember the head flips over. And so, but it goes from here down. To there, basically, right? 
This is how your brain perceives itself through the sensory cortex and the motor cortex. That's how it's based on relative amounts of brain power associated with it, which I think is very interesting. The homunculus. Why are eyes that small? Why don't we all have this What an excellent question. Why are the eyes so small in homunculus? Why wouldn't the eyes be so much bigger? Because this is sensory data. This is the feel data, not visual data. So wow. this is our eyes are really sensitive to feeling. We can actually feel lots of those, but the actual visual data is a different type of data and a different part of the brain, a humongous part of the brain. The whole back of the brain is devoted to the visual, and so that. Why the back? Why the back? That's an excellent question. Why the back? Would I don't know. Make more sense. Go ask your dad. <laughs> it's a great question. I don't know. Go ask your dad. So. We back here. Back to this same old story. Um, oh, hey, do you know the answer to this question? Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll take a break right after this question. Can you guys figure out the answer to this question? A drug that binds to receptors in the hippocampus. Now that we've kind of talked a little bit about some stuff that we know. Is it, does it, uh, number one, cause memory loss and changes in mood? Two, cause memory loss and distorted perceptions? Three, changes in mood and euphoria? Four, euphoria and sleepiness, or five, sleepiness and distorted perceptions. Ashley Crane has a thought or a question. Please share, Ashley Crane. Are you like asking? Like, I am, drug? please. Alcohol? No, I'm not saying what drug. I'm saying what would a drug that binds to the hippocampus do? Oh, which one is that? Yes. Alec has a something well, to think about. Is hippocampus long-term memory? Hippocampus is long-term memory. Is number two? He thinks number two. Well, or is the trick question is all of them? Ava says one and two. I'll tell you, it's or really the answer is going to be one only. Also, it's two. No, it's like one of the two. One of these two? Does anybody have a different idea? I, I would think two because yeah. I don't think the hippocampus has anything to do with yeah. memory. And the perception has to do with memory, I guess. Yeah. Somehow they're correlated, so. Yeah. Anybody else want to change or vote in? You're going to let those two pick it for everybody. Fine. You're going to have to all live with the results. Go, go. Ah. It takes a few seconds to jump up. And the correct answer is, of course, number one. What? Really? Y'all fools. Everybody is, right. Everybody's wrong because you just let those two. You didn't lock it in, I said. Yeah. So, um, the well, correct no, answer is changes in mood. Hippocampus, the hippocampus does, uh, it's part of the limbic system and part of the memory system. Okay? The hippocampus is part of limbic and memory. Limbic is emotion and the memory system. So, it's... So it's going to be changes in mood and in memory loss. Don't worry. That was just a quick test. Let's, oh, what's wrong? Oh, whoops. Let's go back. We'll do this question too, and then I'll be done. What's wrong with this cat? It's ugly. The oh, correct answer is he okay. is a cat. Let me tell you the story of this poor little cat. I think this cat's name is Crush. This poor little cat that's named Crush was shaky. He was wobbly. He was... He was um, not able to run very well. He'd fall over a lot. He did not. Um, he was not able to move very well. He didn't move very well. So my question for you is: Which brain area is likely to be responsible for Crash's peculiar symptoms? And I want everybody to vote on this one. Everybody's going to vote, and I'm going to tally them up. So, which brain area is likely to be responsible for Crash's peculiar symptoms? Is it cerebellum, visual cortex? Sympathetic nervous system or the hippocampus? Maybe it's the hypothalamus. I don't know. But this cat had a very had a difficult time walking. It was all wiggly wobbly. All wiggly wobbly. All right. So, um, how many people think it was the cerebellum? Raise your hand. I don't even think I need to count anymore. Everybody says cerebellum. So, you're gonna sinker. You're gonna sinker. Sink or swim together, and of course it was the cerebellum. Congratulations. Everybody give us wow. a big clap. Yeah. 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 All right, that's, in, that's it for now. I think uh, 28 minutes is enough time for me to talk. I'm tired. Me too.